right, it's now half past six. It's time for us to go through the dailies. And shortly, I'm going to hand over to Zinze Kibiko to introduce the guests and the panel that we're going to have this morning to go through the dailies, but also later on to uh, look at the newsroom. And remember, this morning on the newsroom, we are looking at school unrest and the role that we have as a media and whether maybe we've got to the bottom of what really causes this unrest. Remember, this is not the first time it's happening. And the question that we're running this morning is, do you think the media is fueling unrest in schools? We'll be getting to that shortly but let's look at the dailies and we start off as usual with the standard where the headline is sgr staff gagged as 30 million a day sparks protests now remember the interview that the deputy president had on ntv basically agreed that we were spending um, a billion a month to run the sgr and when it's broken down it's 30 million a day but what is that breakdown Cindy? All right, thank you, Michael. Well, with us in studio this morning, as we prepare for newsroom, I have Dr. Sam Kamau. He is a lecturer at the Aga Khan University. <clears throat> Koki Cheng, who is also a lecturer at the USAU University. It's always good to have both of you here in studio. Um, I'm sure you've seen this, and I'm sure you also watched that interview where Pre uh, Deputy President William Ruto said, it costs Kenyans monthly one billion alone mm -hmm. for the SGR. The startup group went, goes further to break it down to 30 um, million a day. Dr. Sam, do you think <clears throat> that the expense at which Kenyans are paying for this SGR and other major projects alone mm -hmm. is worth in terms of economic benefit vis-a-vis -vis what we have to pay in terms, what are we getting versus what we have to pay for, economic that is? I think when you try to evaluate in terms of the overall economic impact of these uh, projects, mm -hmm. it's a question we may not be able to answer now uh, because uh, some of the intended and intended you know, outcomes of these, I think we'll see that uh, with time. But at least in the immediate, what we know is that uh, we, are, we will be paying uh, dearly mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the loans, in terms of also now the debt that we have continued to add uh, to the country. I would say, of course, there has been the positive in terms of, uh, you know, SGR created some kind of renewal and interest in traveling, uh, you know, to the coast and the positive impact, you would say, for local tourism and all that. But I think uh, overall and with time, I think that there are still questions around that. And I think one of the things the Deputy President did not answer uh, in the interview is uh, when he was saying that the SGR would be able to pay for itself. Mm. Uh, because I think as it stands now, they're even trying to fault some of the importers to use, uh, you know, the SGR to be able to make it economically viable mm. because passenger train was actually not what was the at the heart of it basically we needed to move more cargo out of it and I think all they need to demonstrate to the transporters is that it actually makes more sense to use the SGR uh, instead of using you know the the roads and all that eh? so the question of whether um, you know we are getting value for money it, it's it's hard to answer that question now but in the long term then we'll see whether actually it can spur the growth and you remember one of the key aspects of the SGR is was supposed to connect us to you know Uganda and Rwanda and basically going all the way to Congo there's another side development that has happened of course when you talk about the what happened in Ritri and Ethiopia which may have also affected now the future of the Lamu port so there are all questions around uh, that if they could complete the whole cycle then we can evaluate the benefits. Mm -hmm. Away from the question whether it's economically viable, the other sad part is that at the heart of it, there's actually a racism issue. Koki, listen to this. Mm -hmm. Kenya Railways is probing staff on racism claims that have rocked the Chinese farm running SGR, even as employees have been asked to sign secretary agreement. Mm -hmm. Racism, and it's something here in Kenya we don't talk about even though it happens. Mm -hmm. It's like a quiet little thing that continues to pick on our society here in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Racism is at the heart of this. As much as it's an economic issue, mm -hmm. racism is at the heart of it. Your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that becomes uh, very prevalent in Kenya is that we become very sensitive mm -hmm. to issues that affect how we are treated. I think uh, we've gone through <laughs> so much trauma. I think, in my own opinion, there's too much trauma for anybody to take advantage of us in our own space. So one of the things that SGR will, will of course, uh, suffer and retrieve in terms of memory is the uh, cases of the, remember the Chinese restaurant? Mm -hmm. And what used to happen there? When we begin to dig into issues of racism, let it, uh, and uh, in relation to how institutions handle it, I think there was also another incident at Carrefour. We begin to see that people are alert and they do not like I, th I think Kenyans, people assume that, okay, we are all so welcoming, so they can just behave the way they want to behave in our country. I think it is becoming apparent that Kenyans are intolerant 
of being mishandled, especially in the work front. Mm. Remember that uh, the working population really takes care of many people. It is uh, only, uh, if you look at it critically, one person who works can be taking care of five to ten people. So when that person is kind of mistreated at the workplace and their livelihood is at stake and they are dehumanized, I think it becomes a concern for Kenyan. You touch Kenyan, Kenya issues and Kenyans are together. Dr. Sam, how do we strike, as a nation, how do we strike that balance where, yes, we are welcoming, but at the same time, we don't want to be so xenophobic like some other African countries? Uh, maybe, and first credit to the Standard and the journalist Paul Fuller for doing uh, mm. that story. And I would want to say it goes beyond racism. Eh? Mm. Uh, when you look at the issues that were exposed, you know, the issues that were brought out by that, uh, that particular story. But I think, before I answer your question, when you look at the whole issue of what the Chinese are alleged to be doing, you know, those who are working on the SGR and all that, eh? it is a problem, it's not a Chinese problem, it's a Kenyan problem, mm -hmm. a Kenyan government problem, because somebody has tolerated this, somebody has allowed this. Is this what we signed for? Was this part of the initial agreement? Are the Chinese abusing? you know, the initial agreement in terms of like when you talk about uh, transfer, knowledge transfer, mm. if it is true that actually there has been no significant progress because we were supposed to operate this for some time and some Kenyans were actually supposed to go to China and others are here, they are being trained when you talk about skills transfer so that they could eventually run this. But if it is true that even some basic things that do not require an expatriate is part of what they are doing, mm. then that is why I'm saying we have a bigger problem. And what I would see uh, and what this is likely to affect is what you call the China-Kenya relationship that we have been praising and uh, talking about. Mm. When these things start happening, because yes, we have associated the Chinese with a lot of, you know, the good roads and some of the development projects they have been making. But these are the things that are likely to turn the public anger against them and I think this is part of what this story has done because you are saying you mean this is what is happening behind the scenes behind the mm. smiling faces of mm. Kenyans if you have used the SGR mm. these are some of the questions that need to come there and that is what I'm saying is a Kenyan government issue I am happy because initially according to the story you know is like uh, Kenya railways had uh, dismissed that and said they should be grateful there is a job but in the statement they acknowledge the public anger that it has generated they also acknowledge their issues and promise to carry out investigations I'll be very keen to see, of course, what comes out of this. Have you correctly addressed all the issues? And you remember, it was not just how Kenyan staff are being treated. It's not just about the skills transfer that we are talking about, but it's is issues around conservation and the animals that are being, you know, mm -hmm. uh, killed in the process. All these issues need to be addressed, and I think that is what you'd want to see from the government. All right, Michael, what mm -hmm. else has interest and, and maybe you? just before mm -hmm. we move away from that, still mm -hmm. on racism, mm -hmm. um, so whether we... Uh, as much as we, uh, uh, Koki, you say we are intolerant to racism, do you find that sometimes, uh, I remember the incident at uh, one of the coffee outlets mm -hmm. where there was a lady who was uh, mistreated because she was with a you know, uh -huh. white person. Mm -hmm. Do we also kind of, um, how would I call it, fuel it ourselves? And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. There's a time I was walking into a mall and uh, there happened to be a white family in front of me and they passed without being checked. Mm -hmm. Yet the guard wanted to check me. Lot. And yeah. at that point uh -huh. I was like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, you know, so do we sometimes, as much as we're intolerant, mm -hmm. are we also sometimes uh, find ourselves, that our own selves, you know, we, we Yeah, kinda... I think we are trained to be subservient, even to things we shouldn't be tolerant to. We are trained to be kind, you know, this issue about hospitality, this issue about taking in anybody who has trouble. It's like we are the grandmother of uh, East Africa and the world, and therefore, because of that, then we don't think we are important. And I think it's important that we begin to educate ourselves about issues for example, labor issues. You know, that, that example that Michael has given also reminds me of a daily one that I think as Kenyans we face. You are in a supermarket mm -hmm. and you end up, especially when these new paper bags were introduced, mm -hmm. you end up putting your own groceries, but if it's a white person or a different person, mm -hmm. they are served in a different manner. Well, but, I, I, I don't like blaming the victim uh, <laughs> for the suffering. We are victims of a long colonial history and maybe aspects of that in terms of uh, feel, feeling inferior. Mm -hmm. But I think one of, one of the things I'm saying that in terms of being mistreated in your own country, because mm -hmm. I agree with you, perhaps it's in our minds in terms of how we treat other people, but at times I think, uh, like they say, you only be treated to the extent that you're willing mm -hmm. also to uh, mistreat you yourself. So yes, it's in terms of uh, us being able to stand up. But like I am saying, uh, it's also a Kenyan government 
problem when mm. these abuses are reported mm. and what action what, follows what after that? that? I think yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Very what important. happened to the restaurant? Yeah, of course there was a lot of flack. I think those are one of the early incidences that uh, brought out the issue of racism and mm. people begin began to talk about labor issues mm. and how we are treated. But again, I'm saying we cannot just say 50 years, I don't know, after independence, mm. that we are 60 still, uh, 60 years, that we are still subservient, we are still under colonial rule. Colonial rule left in the 60s. It's so still in our minds, it, yes, unfortunately. We should uh, create awareness or sensitize our, ourselves and our public in mm. general that uh, you mm. need to know your rights, you need to stand for your rights. It's just that we are not allowed to be vocal about what we or our society trains us to be quiet mm. when you're being mistreated. Okay. And this is an era where you have to speak out. You have to speak out. But yeah. credit and, and, to and the media and the social media, of course, for bringing out these issues, because that's part of what drives absolutely. the Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I, we're hopefully going to try and get a lawyer just to find out how legal uh, part of this, uh, one of the gags that uh, has been imposed on the workers of, of the SGR is not to take pictures and post them on social media. So that leaves us, of course, with the question, what is it that they're hiding? On the story mm. that was there yeah. previously mm. was uh, the question of even the restaurant that they use the sitting places. Mm. Apparently, mm. if a Chinese person was sitting on a, a table, they would not be allowed to um, sit on the same table. Yeah. So, of course, that is a question that we want answered. Maybe, maybe before and, we leave, uh, sorry? I, I'm, I'm very aggrieved about the issue of corporal punishment. I mean, for me, that picture, if it is true that it was not a drill or some <laughs> sort of, you know, mm. thing, I, I think abuse. that is... Really, really unfortunate. All, All right, right Michael. And, and we do have a lawyer, Harun Ndubi, who's joining us now, and we'd just like to find out from him. Thank you for joining us this early, uh, Harun. And uh, the subject matter we'd like to look at is uh, this particular story on the standard. SGR staff gagged um, as 30 million a day sparks protests, but mainly to look at the aspect where they've been told not to take pictures and not to post them on social media. Now, the question here is, how legal is that? Is that infringing on their rights? Harun. All right, and um, I'll repeat the question, Harun, in case you hadn't heard it the first time. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And we're looking at this uh, particular headline on the standard SGR staff gagged, and more specifically on the fact that they have been asked to sign um, a non-disclosure uh, form whereby they will not be allowed to take pictures, or rather they, they should not be allowed to take pictures and post them on social media. So we'd like to find out how legal that is, and in that, is that infringing on their rights, Harun? Uh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> I, I think obviously it is illegal. It's unconstitutional. Um, it's unknown to law. And mm -hmm. they, it, they are not bound to sign it. In any event, um, if you are asked to sign an, an illegal document, uh, even if you signed it, it would have no legal effect really. Okay, but would that put them at risk of their jobs? Because I'm sure the condition here would be if you don't sign it, then you possibly would lose your job. If you follow the law, then no one needs to lose their job because they have refused to sign an illegal document. Mm -hmm. uh, if they will be required to leave their jobs because of failure to sign, then the management must either take them to court or take them through due process mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, uh, the issues related to that document has, have been uh, dealt with adequately, and uh, which would mean a, a tribunal of some sort, uh, whether at the management level uh, with, the, with the workers involved or, uh, or, a, or a court. Uh, I think we, are, uh, we have taken impunity too, too far. Um, uh, the action requiring that the, uh, the staff sign that document mm -hmm. is really a statement of impunity by management mm -hmm. and uh, states, uh, would, would really say that they, uh, they, they have, the management has no re regard for the law at all. Okay. And uh, just it's before we release... document. Okay. 
And, and before we release you on the question of racism, if one faced racism, for instance, uh, according to this story, there are even tables where silently they're not allowed to share with their Chinese counterparts. What does one, uh, how does one seek redress on something like that? Is there a law that one can literally fall back on to, you know, seek redress? If they wanted to take the law, uh, rather the issue to court, they can. Uh, because it's obviously uh, discriminatory and uh, Article 27 of the Constitution, pro you know, uh, uh, prohibits discrimination. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would say if um, management doesn't take that issue and redress it, anybody, including uh, uh, yourself, could actually go to court on that issue and seek court redress. But more importantly, I think I should say that... Um, is the our political economy which needs to be reviewed so that the political leadership needs to say very strongly that it's abhors you know racism and it doesn't happen just at the very basic level of not sharing tables but even the salary structures also would indicate that they are not uh, provided with uh, equal pay for equal labor mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Harun Dubi, for uh, giving us uh, that update. Uh, thank you very much for that. So basically, uh, that's a standard. And of course, what we're highlighting is this uh, story that uh, began, I think, uh, on Sunday, as the, the standard broke that uh, there was racism within the SGR. But moving to other stories uh, within the standard, and uh, or maybe let's look at the Daily Nation, uh, where the headline is, Why We Left Ruto Out of the Handshake Matter politics and this of course is another very juicy story politically speaking uh, because there's been speculation as to whether first of all Ruto was aware according to the interview he did uh, not too long ago he said that actually they did have a conversation with the president that the handshake should take place but Raila comes out and says well there's a good reason why we left them out so um, Sam let me start with you your thoughts on this uh, particular story well, uh, first, of course, in terms of the handshake, which was a welcome thing, uh, given the, what we had gone through as a country mm. last year. But I think uh, what is coming out is that the intrigues around the handshake in terms of the details, because there is what they told us, uh, you know, what the handshake was about. But we have seen it has continued now, actually even fueling the conversation around 2022. Mm -hmm. And I know Raila said that part of the reason they did not want to have, uh, you know, Calonzo and Ruto was to, you know, because they were interested in 2022. But you can look at it, uh, what happened immediately after that is that Ruto took the handshake uh, to, you, you know, the Building Bridges Initiative to go now and uh, vigorously, you know, campaign for example, in the coast, uh, saying it is part of the handshake and get, reaching out to the members of the opposition. So using the very thing actually to drive, you know, fuel conservation around the 2022. But you've also seen now the politics around, because for me the politics around now the handshake, even what uh, Raila said yesterday, mm -hmm. is he knew that it's more likely to make headlines and also fuel the conversation around. He's a cheeky side uh, to it, and I think we'll still continue seeing uh, much of this. Mm -hmm. But I think what is important, instead of dwelling on it so much, uh, the Deputy President and say that the president has the right to make decisions that are good for the country. And the handshake we have all acknowledged was actually good for the country in terms of calming the political tension so that we can actually see more government projects and the government agenda being implemented. So I would not want again to be caught up in the intrigues, who was involved, he was not involved, what does this mean for 2022? So but for me, the only thing I would want to caution about is the fact that although the handshake was actually supposed to bring the country together, it's also becoming a divisive issue mm -hmm. uh, when you look at it because you expect a reaction from the deputy president's camp in regard to this. So for me, this is actually a concern. Eh? But away yeah. from the handshake issue, um, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Raila Odinga had hinted mm -hmm. on constitutional changes. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, okay, and I'd love to hear your thoughts because <laughs> first and foremost, we are all Kenyans right here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that IEBC has the power and, and uh, not even just power, the confidence to give, make sure that if we were to go for a constitutional change, that they have the ability to handle that election. Why? They have a CEO who is in suspension, they have commissioners who are not at work, their in-house wrangles was in and out every single day with the mm -hmm. ABC. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they'll be able, they have the ability to handle us going into changing the constitution? We normally forget IBC after elections and we don't really pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think the challenge is not so much whether they can do it, it's whether they've got their house 
together, which is another issue. But I like the, the, the subheading that says, hush, hush, uh, 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 spills beans, <laughs> hush, hush. The language in itself is so dramatic. I thought it was like a play. Hush, hush, you know, spills beans, hush, mm -hmm. hush, then constitutional change. What is the issue? What is the issue? Does, uh, do politicians think that Kenyans should always be in a mood to pursue political agenda? And we should ask ourselves why. Why is it that there is that hush hush and constitutional change? I think then the political class is really taking advantage yeah. of a Kenyans per se. Mm -hmm. We are already exhausted from an election. We don't even know whether we should have another. Then already there is the element of constitutional change. Now, is that is are they very you know, focused on activities that feed into their souls, or are they really interested in making sure that this country moves forward? So that's a question maybe I would ask in my head, because I think we have just come from an election, it's barely eight months, I hope, and now we're already talking about another, what is it, we know, the no or yes campaign, mm -hmm. and then now again in the middle of that will be in the next electioneering period. I mean, I think we need to be a, a bit break. critical. And of course the break. question then would be who benefits out of all that? Is exactly. it really the Monainchi or not? Page yeah. five, uh, there's also an interesting story then, maybe just to get your thoughts as we wind up. Governor's immunity claims sparks a pro. Uh, Sam, governors are seeking immunity like the president. <laughs> you know, they want to be above the law. <laughs> oh no. I am very sure whatever is driving that claim. I mean, you cannot run away from accountability. One of the things that we have seen with the devolution is that it's a good thing for the country. But we have also seen corruption now has been properly devolved. And because of weak uh, control structures uh, at the county level, even the MCAs who are supposed to have some kind of an oversight role, if uh, you saw the other day saying that they actually needed to be bribed to pass a budget, mm. how do you expect such people mm. to actually have some oversight role over the same, uh, you know, county government? So the governor are, let's say, they are just afraid because I think when they saw one of them uh, being handcuffed, eh, that may, has actually, may have I've actually sent, sent shivers, you know, mm -hmm. sent a message that nobody is safe. And you saw the way they are always quickly, you know, they run to come together and start, of course, uh, you know, defending uh, one of their own. But I think this is uh, mischievous. Nobody can escape accountability. It is there uh, in the law. So they actually have to submit to the processes and we actually have now to put the, you know, cause uh, the searchlight on the counties in terms of expenditure because there are so many uh, bad stories that are coming from the counties in terms of how public money is being uh, spent. So I would actually say they, they will not escape. It, it, it's not even anchored in law in terms of what they are trying to mm. claim for. And this thing of people saying that we are being targeted, it's witch hunting, when actually they are, there is clear evidence that you may have interfered either with the process. And I'm sure if we actually get to that place of doing the lifestyle audits eh, when we get there, especially for the government, you will actually be shocked in terms of uh, what is and that is why you see in a place like Nigeria many of the former governors eh, they spend most of their you know time after politics in courts and others in jail mm. and that is where we'll eventually get as a country yeah. all right we're gonna pause on that specific conversation a good a great point rather from dr. Sam we're taking a quick commercial break but when we come back Michael Gitonga with the same panel will also dive into the newsroom where we're gonna take a look at this headlines but from a media perspective and on that note our Twitter question this morning is do you think that the media is fueling unrest in schools? Tweet us at KTN News, at Michael G. Gitonga, at Zinzi underscore K. We'd love to hear your thoughts. We're taking a quick commercial break for our KTN home viewers. We'll say goodbye. Our KTN News viewers, this conversation continues.